band can be as good as you'd like, but in, I think in a stadium situation, the only way you're going to really reach out to the audience is to have a really special front man. You know, and you can count them probably the fingers of one hand, Robert Plant, Freddie Mercury. You have a very extrovert stage act by any standards. Will you be able to go on with... You mean I flaunt it? You're mm. over the top. <laughs> no. And Freddie had complete utter confidence. Yes, of course, of course, darling, of course we'll do it. You know, completely unrealistic at the time, but, you know, here we are. He used to bring a guitar and um, in his own little room, he used to hammer on all his music and I sometimes used to tell him, you've got to think about neighbours, it's not very good. Very few bands managed to transcend the the, the, the hardcore album-buying heavy rock audience as well as the fickle pop audience. Um, and maintain a level of success for as long as Queen did. They never went with a trend. They were always just their own individual style. And so no matter what the trends around them are, it, it just kind of exists as their own little unit. This Two Queens is a great, great rock band and is a great, great pop band. And the two kind of work perfectly in tandem with each other. And I don't think there's a lot of bands that you could say that about. So you look at it as a, the beginning of your friendship with, with Hungary and with Budapest, and it, it may last long, as long as Queen will last. If I'm still alive, I will come back. You know. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you. It's quite good to get job satisfaction after 14 years. Well, it's a pretty good job, isn't it? It's a great experience, and I think it will open the eyes of uh, a lot of uh, uh, people who are working on the show. No. I think over the years he's proven himself to be one of the great British guitarists. He's got his own style, he's got his own sound, he's got his own approach. That's the thing about Brian May, he was never an extravagant guitarist. If anything, he was a bit understated, but he was a unique individual, and I think he's been an inspiration to a lot of others. Roger, myself and Paul have been in the studio doing our first studio album. I can't believe I'm saying this really, but it's, it's kind of like a new group. We have a, a load of new songs, completely new material. To be honest, I think Freddie would have hated the idea of being 60. Um, it would have been appalled, uh, and uh, so would we. The body of work um, is tremendous, you know. And I forgot just how early they started. I forgot that they actually got together in the late 60s. You could look on Queen as really as being four kind of typical rock fans from the late 60s. Um, they were of that age to have grown up with the Beatles, the Stones, and then along came Cream and Jimi Hendrix and eventually Led Zeppelin. So by the time they were going off to college and university, it would have been about 1969, first Led Zeppelin album had come out. They were all very inspired by that. And uh, that's where they came together, you know, the uh, Imperial College at London University, which is where Brian May was studying. Brian and Roger had been in a band called Smile, um, who hadn't really amounted to very much. Uh, the, the bassist and the vocalist in Smile was a band called Tim Staffel. And I think when eventually when um, Tim Staffel decided that he didn't want to carry on, um, Freddie was quite happy to put himself forward as, as the man to sort of replace him. Suddenly Brian May and Roger Meadows-Taylor were left looking for a singer and a bassist. So young Freddie Bolsaro said, well, why don't I try out? Let's see what I can do. And he joined the band, but he couldn't play bass as well, so they auditioned, and the guy they got in was a chap called John Deacon. The first thing Freddie Bolsaro did was say, I think Smile's a really bad name. I got an idea, we should call ourselves Queen. In a way, he was immediately putting his stamp on the band even before they got off the ground, and he himself did not become Freddie Bolsaro, he changed the name to Freddie Mercury, hence the birth of what we know and love as Queen. But from day one, and because of that, I think Freddie Mercury almost became the leader of the band because he drove things forward, even with their name. From one star to another, today Feltham honoured their most famous son. Thousands of fans and residents joined family and friends who unveiled a permanent memorial to the legend that was Freddie Mercury. I wanted to change the world in some way you know, and, and make music that no one had ever made. And Freddie had complete, utter confidence. Yes, of course, of course, darling, of course we'll do it. You know, completely unrealistic at the time, but, you know, here we are. So that's what makes me feel rather nice about being here, you know, to come back here. And he's a hero here, which is wonderful, you know, and he deserves to be a hero. He respected us 
no matter how, wherever he went around in the world, he used to fall and let us know he's OK. Do you remember him in Felton playing music in the house? Yes, he used to bring a guitar and um, in his own little room he used to hammer on all his music and I sometimes used to tell him, you've got to think about neighbours, it's not very good. And in the end he said it's time that he moved out, <laughs> which I didn't like. Now and again Brian would pop over and they would do a jamming session and I always remember he would always play Jimi Hendrix. During that period of time, you know, the very early 70s, uh, there was what they called progressive rock and what wasn't called heavy metal at the time, uh, it was called heavy rock at the time, um, and it eventually became called heavy metal, but that's really what it was. Uh, you know, you had your Black Sabbath, you had your riffs, the big riffs, big guitar riffs, bass guitar playing in unison, uh, and the, the singer generally, you know, wailing on the top of it, and the guitar is playing lots of solos. But the thing that they had that was different was their interest in progressive rock and Freddie's interest in classical music and opera, which came out later, of course, in things like Bohemian Rhapsody and lots of other tunes, bits and pieces in there all, all over the place. Um, so uh, their influences to start with, however, were definitely progressive rock and heavy rock. I personally usually used to go and see bands live, um, A, because I liked seeing bands live, and B, because I was also producing a Radio 1 series called In Concert, so I needed to know that they could cut it live and, you know, get an audience going. But sometimes we would book bands on the strength of a really good tape or something that somebody had, had brought into us. In the case of Queen, the first I remember hearing of them was uh, a tape brought in by a guy called... Um, Ronnie Beck, who worked for Feldman Publishers, I think, and uh, Bernie Andrews and I, who, who, Bernie's another producer at Radio 1, um, Ronnie knew the sort of music that we liked and he thought that the band were pretty good and that we, you know, we would go for it. And uh, he told us how good they were, but they weren't at the time performing anywhere live, so you couldn't actually sort of see them. So anyway, Bernie booked them in for a session uh, sometime in 73, and then a couple of months later I booked them for Bob Harris's programme. And uh, so that's, you know, it went from there. By the time they made the first album, 1973, they'd been together a while. John Deacon was playing bass in the band. They'd done a, they'd done a lot of gigs at the time. And, you know, and they were, signed to a, they were signed to a management company. They sort of, the management cut them a deal to get studio time at, I think it was at Trident Studios. But it was sort of, you know, they'd be going in for a few hours at sort of starting at two o'clock in the morning or, or getting in if David Bowie cancelled a session, they'd kind of jump in. So the first Queen album was put together uh, under those sort of circumstances. So I think they were still at that, that stage that bands are at where they're all pulling together. It's a very heavy record. Um, it's a typical heavy 70s heavy rock record, but there's a lot of other stuff, a lot of influences in there as well, of all the kind of things they were listening to. And a lot of Freddie Mercury's sort of ambition uh, is already coming out there, you know, the, the grand vocal tricks uh, and just, just the sort of the scope of the songwriting. You can see they're reaching for something more than just a kind of a, a straight blues rock kind of format. As a debut, it was very consistent and extremely solid. Now, I actually happened to see them live at the Imperial College in London just before the album came out, purely by accident. I'd never heard of them particularly at the time. And on stage, particularly the great King Rat and Keep Yourself Alive came, up, came into their own. They were tremendous pieces of music. So I was immediately aware of them when the album came out. And to be honest, because they had such a vibrancy live on record, they didn't quite seem to capture that. But the songs that really survived, I suppose, The Great King Rat and Keep Yourself Alive were the two that really survived through a long period of time and years and became big fan favourites, and deservedly so. But I think from, from the start, the hallmarks of Queen were Brian May's guitar and Freddie Mercury's vocals and a certain flamboyance. Even on record, they had that flamboyance. Although they hadn't done much performing live, and I certainly hadn't seen them live, it was pretty obvious that they'd spent a lot of time rehearsing because uh, when they came into the studio, they were pretty much ready for They knew what they wanted to do, pretty much how to do it. So here we were doing stereo broadcasts. So, and Queen, especially with the sort of stuff that Brian plays, were absolutely the ideal band to use stereo effects on. And they had all sorts of little gimmicks up their Steve and so on. But I mean, pretty much, they're a, a, a basically very good rock group. The only thing I would say is that I knew they were pretty good, I have to say this, and Freddie, I thought, had potential, although at the time was nowhere near as powerful a singer as he became later on.
Queen 2 is my favourite Queen album. It always has been and always will be. I love that record because of his pomposity. And by pomposity, I mean pomp rock. And people always associate pomp rock if they're associated with anything with America and the 70s sticks and Kansas sounds. But this is where it all started. Huge swathes of sound, completely overblown, utterly ridiculous, taken to the nth degree. If you have to put Queen into some sort of category, I suppose it would be pomp rock. But that sounds a little sort of precious and perhaps uh, and possibly a bit insulting. I don't think it is. I mean, I just... I think one could describe them as that because there was a sort of pomposity about it, which Freddie, you know, we know that he loved it. I mean, it's all this, again, going back to the Live Aid performance, the way he was prancing around the stage as he owned the bloody place. And that, for those few minutes at that particular time, he did. You know, so there was a certain amount of pomposity about it. But on the other hand, if you listen to the music, it was really good rock. So, pomp rock, if it has to be something. Queen 2 was just sort of building upon everything that they'd done with Queen 1. At the end of Queen 1, you get a snippet of a song, um, which is called Seven Seas of Rye, which was the big, big hit off of Queen 2. Um, because basically having sort of just toyed with the idea at the tail end of the first Queen album, it's almost like they're sort of, sort of it's like, you know, and moving on, and, and suddenly, and, and here we are. From the Queen 2 album, the Seven Seas of Rye, I think is a standout track, and and has become a sort of classic from that era. Um, and that's very typical of, of a Queen uh, composition. Uh, and it's, it's still, th the style of composition is still there even to this, this day, you know, or in their last album that they made. This is Queen 2, their second album. And inside it is a little letter which Freddie had written. It says, Dear Jeff, thanks again for those lovely sessions you did for us. Hope you like our new one, Queen 2. Hope to see you soon. Love, Freddie Mercury, and the other guys have all signed it as well. And I'm quite pleased I've got that. <laughs> Queen 2, it, it, it's definitely a move on from Queen 1. I mean, the cover, the Mick Rock photo of the four of them, which they revived for Bohemian Rhapsody, that's a very kind of, you know, it's a very iconic image. It immediately sort of, it, it, the album sounds like it looks, you know, quite pompous, quite overblown, taking itself very, very seriously. But there's also, quite, there's also a streak of camp humour running through it. Um, so you're starting to get that in there as well. I think the interesting thing about it is that it's also, you realise that unlike most bands who have one or two songwriters, all four of them were writing songs. You know, Roger Taylor, even the drummer. You know, in the case of Queen, Roger Taylor's role has always been far more than just the drummer. So he gets a crack at it. He's singing one of the tracks on there and he's writing stuff on it. Most of it sounds a bit like Led Zeppelin, but yeah, the, the grand stuff is very much attributable to, to Freddie Mercury and Brian May. There was a complexity about their sound, which was evident on the first album, but very much on the second album as well. So much so that some people had thought that they used uh, synthesizers. And in fact, John Peel once made a comment about that. Oh, he hadn't. Oh, I can't remember exact, the exact quote from John, but it was something along the lines of, "I don't normally like the sound of synthesizers." Of course, we're talking about analog synthesizers in those days, uh, but. If they're going to be used, this is a good way to use them. And I think on the next album, uh, possibly on Queen 2, I can't remember, but it's certainly there somewhere, they actually say, and there were no synthesizers used. Because actually all of that was um, Brian May overlaying his various guitar bits and pieces, you know. Sheer Heart Attack, the third Queen album, that's the breakthrough album. I mean, it went to number two in the UK. They had Roy Thomas Baker producing it, who'd go on to produce other albums, and he, including, uh, obviously, the single Bohemian Rhapsody. But it had their first big proper hit with Killer Queen. I think that song kind of encapsulates everything that Queen were about at the time, because it, it jumps from, it sounds like Freddie Mercury playing the piano in a sort of Victorian drawing room. Next minute, it jumps into this sort of Jimmy Page mind-bending guitar solo. The whole thing, it, there's a lot going on just, just in the one track. And again, it's very camp. You know, they're singing about Moe Shandon, they're singing about Marie Antoinette. You know, these aren't the kind of topics that were being name-checked by every other band, most other bands at the time. You know, they didn't sing about champagne and, you know, figures from French history. It was, you know, it was just sex and drugs and that was it. You know, so they're, they're, it's, it's a great, one well, most important thing is it's a great pop song. And I think it shows really early on 
that for all the sort of drama and all the heavy metal that they were doing, they also knew how to write a great three minute pop song. I think of all the tracks on Sheer Heart Attack, Killer Queen, the big hit single, is probably the closest to showing us the steps that would be taken by the band a little later on in their career, even on Night of the Opera. It has the elements of Freddie Mercury with the, the harmonies. It allows Brian May room to really manoeuvre on guitar, but it's still very much a band song. And for me, it's probably the best track on Sheer Heart Attack. Very f closely followed by Stone Cold Crazy, but very much the best track. And it, uh, it really introduced Queen, or started to introduce Queen to a bigger audience. When you get, or well, you had in those days, a top three single, you weren't just talking about the diehards, you had started to cross into a slightly wider audience. So more people were aware of Queen than had been the case before. Sheer Heart Attack is certainly the point where Queen take a major step um, up from what they've been doing on the first couple of records. Um, and it, it's really the, and it's the one that, that sort of certainly um, pushes them a lot more forward um, in terms of popularity. Amazingly, it's also probably the heaviest album that they've made up until this point. Um, you know, those, the first series of Queen records are very, very heavy records, very loud. Um, there is a lot less of the kind of um, the the diversity that would soon appear on the likes of Bohemian Rhapsody and then become very much a staple part of what they did. Um, so it's it's less it's got less of the less of the, the progressive inclinations of the first two records. And it's really it's, it's quite a heavy metal album. Now I'm here is on there and that's one of the heaviest big hit singles that Queen ever had. Now I'm here is one of the standout kind of heavy numbers on Sheer Heart Attack. Live, when they, they used to do it live, it turned into this sort of showcase for Freddie Mercury would do this um, very kind of grandstanding vocal thing where he'd, you know, he'd sing to the audience, the audience would sing back to him. It usually go on for quite a long period of time. Um, probably best appreciated if you're actually at the gig. I mean, as a song, it's, 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 it's got one of Brian May's best riffs. It's great, great kind of headbanging track. And it's actually, it's all about the band um, when they first toured, they actually supported Mott the Hoople, um, who of course were, uh, you know, idols of theirs at the time. And it's actually a lot of it is, is, is a sort of almost a homage to Mott the Hoople. I think now I'm here along with, I have to say, nearly every song that Freddie Mercury sang is classic singing. I mean, the thing that attracted me, obviously Brian May as a guitar player attracted me to Queen. But the, the other thing that attracted me to Queen, secondly, was Freddie Mercury's vocals. And then their compositions and their sound were the other things that attracted me to them. But Freddie Mercury, I think this is perhaps an early indication of, of his prowess and abilities that were to come. For me, Sheer Heart Attack was really just establishing a style and a blueprint which Queen 2 had introduced, and ironically, ending it as well, because that was the end of phase one of their career. A Night at the Opera, I mean, it's, it's widely trotted out as, as one of Queen's best, or Queen's best albums, mainly because, of course, Bohemian Rhapsody's on there. So it's a big, big hit album, even bigger hit than Sheer Heart Attack. I don't know if it's necessarily their best album, but it's certainly the most overblown, and everything about it, from the, sort of the crest on the cover, which I think was originally designed by Freddie Mercury, everything about it just kind of screams excess, screams sort of opulence. I think it was Freddie Mercury who once said of Night at the Opera, this is the moment that we went into the studio and just put everything in. There were no barriers. Now, I'm not quite sure if they had an epiphany, but something happened that transported the Queen we all knew and loved from the first three albums to something radically different. Because you listen to Night at the Opera, and it took me a while to get into the record because it was so different back then. What you had was a melting pot. You had... Lazing on a Sunday afternoon, which is inspired by Noel Coward. You had Love of My Life, one of the big power ballads of all time. Already a fan favourite, actually, from live performance, even back then. You had 39, which is almost an acoustic science fiction song, courtesy of Brian May. You had a metallic song, I'm in Love With My Car, which was a Roger Taylor composition. And you had the Prophet song, which was nearly 10 minutes long, certainly nine minutes plus, which actually was so complex and so sprawling and so epic, it makes Bohemian Rhapsody seem like a simple pop ditty. Queen have, have an ability to be an eclectic musical band, always. Um, for instance, on that same record, you have You're My Best Friend, um, which was written by John Deacon, 
which is a, a love song about someone who's so special to, to John Deacon that no matter what happens in the world, this person, I would imagine his girlfriend, my wife, whatever, uh, is the most imp important person in the world. And he wants to tell her that. He wants to say, no matter what happens to me, because you're there, my life is better. Which is extraordinary, you know, juxtaposed to Mama, I just killed a man, put a gun straight to his head, pulled the trigger, now he's dead. Possibly at the time, the most inscrutable hit single ever. Before that, no one had even thought about something like that being a hit, except maybe from a Beatles or a hugely established artist. But even they hadn't really gone that far. And Bohemian Rhapsody, with its different parts, its cod opera Gilbert and Sullivan, its barbershop cortex, its complete change of time and, and direction on occasions, was the antithesis of the hit single, and it was over six minutes long. And what Queen basically did, in fact, what Queen did in the whole album, was take the formula for success, burn it, and feed the ashes to the music business people who said, this is never going to be anything other than a huge flop for you lot. You've made a huge mistake. There'd never been anything like Bohemian Rhapsody. Um, you know, I mean, it, there'd be nothing like the song and there'd be nothing like the, uh, the, the then promotional film, as they were then called, that was put together... Um, you know, to present it, I don't think it was the first time that the really elaborate operatic themes that you know you, you you could tell because of the way that Queen, you know, they're a very good vocal band. Roger, Brian, Freddie, all very adept vocalists. You know, with great different ranges, they used their voices incredibly well um, in unison together. Um, so I suppose it was only inevitable that, that was given sort of somebody as flamboyant as Freddie that eventually to come up with this sort of like ridiculously overblown heavy metal opera. Um, but they did and they got away with it. So this was an album that was a melting pot of different styles which allowed Queen to be what they'd never been before, which was a band of the modern era that wasn't a rock band, wasn't a pop band, but it could, could appeal to both sides. And my feeling was, a lot of the diehards who got into the first three albums were a little disappointed when Night of the Opera came out because they weren't our band anymore. And it's only over a period of time you realise how much they put into that record, how amazing it was. And that's why it stands as one of the greatest albums of all time. And really a template for any band who say we want to be diverse. If any band ever says, well, you have to be a certain way in a certain direction, well, Queen didn't. They had the bravery and the adventure to go out and try something, and they had a lot to lose. They'd already had a good fan base, they were successful, they were building, but they took a huge risk with that record, and it worked. Day at the Races was the follow-up to A Night at the Opera. The cover looks the same, it's just black. I always get the two albums mixed up. I think most people do. I think it comes across, unfortunately, as a bit of a kind of a poor man's copy of A Night at the Opera. I mean, wisely, they decided not to use Roy Thomas Baker on that because the feeling was they obviously wanted to try something different, but they kept Mike Stone, so you've still got the same sound. I wouldn't say it's a, radic a radically different album. I think, I think of those two albums together, almost think of them as being, you know, parts of the same project, almost. News of the World was a 1977 album, which came out at the time when punk was sweeping the world. And if you think back then, Punk was supposed to be about destroying and undermining everything that bands like Queen allegedly stood for. Well, it didn't do that. However, Queen certainly adapted to the times. Having gone for very lush, overblown approaches for so long, they stripped back in a way and went for a very straightforward, song-oriented approach on News of the World. And even had a, a cover that was very basic, the huge robot, the 1950s robot, as it were, as opposed to the regal crests of yore, certainly a night of the opera and day of the races. Queen were very much part of the old guard that punk was supposed to do away with. Um, you know, they, they, how dare they even think to become so big with something like Bohemian Rhapsody, right, we've got to do away with that sort of thing. Um, but hindsight proves News of the World to be a great hard rock album um, with some brilliant songs on it. I mean, it's got We Will Rock You on it. It's got We Are The Champions on it. When Queen did jazz, you could see that they were reaching for something else, for a different sound, because obviously punk and new wave had come along and they were very much in the firing line. They were one of the bands that were targeted, targeted, if you like, and seen, not so much as boring old farts, but kind of rich, young farts or younger farts. That was always one of the things that upset a lot of punk bands and a lot of fans, was that Queen, or certainly Freddie Mercury, flaunted their wealth 
and their lifestyle, probably far more so than older bands like Pink Floyd and Led Zeppelin, who of course were much richer and a bit older as well at the time, had been around longer. There was something about Queen that I think really got up people's noses. And by about, by about 1978, you get the feeling that they knew they had to change and they had to adjust. Jazz is an insane record. It's, it's just a mix of there's so much going on in there, pop, heavy metal, country, funk. Um, it's a strange sounding record. It was Queen being eclectic again, as they were in Night at the Opera, but in different styles. You had the Middle Eastern tinge of Mustafa, for instance. You had um, Fat Bottom Girls which was so ridiculous. I mean, what on earth is that about? It's what is surreal in its own way, that it almost anti-PC, if you want. So what they were doing was almost pastiching themselves to some extent, but also becoming very much more of a modern pop band and bringing influences in from the Middle East, from acoustic stuff, electronically. There was first hints on jazz of what they were to do on Hot Space, I feel, although they did it much um, on a much lower level, thankfully, on jazz than was the case with Hot Space. So I think they were experimenting with different styles and sounds, and they were very much a modern, sophisticated pop band. They actually look, I feel at the time, more perhaps to towards what the tourists or the police were doing, for instance, and Genesis was starting to do, than towards what was happening in the rock world at the time. And that really reinforces the fact that by that point, although they had a huge rock audience, they were very much a mature pop band. I, I don't mind jazz's diversity in any way whatsoever, because you've got stuff like um, Don't Stop Me Now, but you've got Mustafa, which are that eastern sort of tinged heavy metal, which I thought was brilliant fat bottom girls and bicycle race i mean they're two of the greatest singles i think that queen released and again perfect examples of a band being able to put out a loud up tempo and, and pretty heavy single and get away with it and being seen as a pop band what band now would be would get away with it with a song like this fat bottom girls about celebrating the size of women's asses by a singer who was quite clearly gay, although not necessarily out at the time, and Bicycle Race, which is inspired by a Tour de France rider that Freddie Mercury has had a fling with. You know, fantastic, absolutely fantastic. You couldn't, you couldn't make it up. So jazz is saved, I think, by those two tracks. Listen to it start to finish, though. It, it sounds... You, you were tempted to say, put the drugs away, everybody go home, and try and have a good night's sleep. The game came out in 1980, it's their first album of the new decade, and you could see that there'd been a real change. And previously on Queen albums, they'd had this little sleeve note that said, no, no synthesizers. Obviously, there's synthesizers all over the game. Um, the band have changed by then. You look at the cover as well, it's quite, um, it's a simple group shot. They've all had haircuts, especially Freddie, um, and so, and they're all into the leather jacket. So it's a much more kind of, uh, it's a much more basic, you know, to use the word punk would be uh, stretching a bit too far, but they're obviously not, they've moved away from the sort of satins and the frills and the big production appearance of the, of the earlier records. Um, it's an album that had some, again, it's the beginning of kind of Queen's pop career. It's more of a pop album than a rock album. Um, and, and it paid off, you know, it, it worked for them. It gave, it's brought them into the States. It was one of the albums that broke them in America. Following up on the back of Live Killers in 79, which really ended that part of their career, they moved on to a different level. And it's got rockabilly and rock and roll on there. Crazy little thing called Love, for instance, is in there. Another one bites the dust. Suddenly, Freddie had very short hair. <laughs> and people were going, what the hell is going on? they're a lot more adept at writing for the more commercial ear, um, but without losing sight of who they, who they are. Now, I mean, jazz is diverse, um, the game even more so. I know, I know it's quite heavily criticised, but again, I think it's a good record. And you can only judge a record, really, by whether you enjoy the songs on it. And the confusion that crept in was that, that, that they'd had the audacity to sort of toy with rockabilly with crazy little thing called love and then john deacon's wicked brutal funk riff for um another one bites the dust once again you know we've done classical we've done opera we've done gospel we've done heavy metal we've done progressive and and here we are doing 50s rock and we're doing funk as well on the same record and it's and it's okay and it's working because we can so that showed to me uh an expansion again, musical expansion. They hadn't really 
being quite so blatant about the 50s style until a crazy little thing called Love. And they were able to do it and, and make it work. With each succeeding album, they tended to experiment a little bit in different directions. Sometimes it worked, other times it didn't. And obviously it had a bit of a rockabilly phase where they went in to do the game. Hence, crazy little thing called Love and Another One Bites the Dust. Although I have to say that Another One Bites the Dust is probably more funk rock mm -hmm. than crazy little thing called Love. But there again, actually it shows up one of the crucial elements that everyone mentions, certainly when Another One Bites the Dust and later when Under Pressure, how brilliant was the bass line? John Deacon never got the credit he deserved because he was overshadowed by Freddie Mercury, definitely, and to a great extent by Brian May and even Roger Taylor. So poor John Deacon was stuck at the back, but you listen to the bass lines and actually realise this guy is good. And in a way, he encapsulates what Queen could do. Very disciplined, very focused, very aware of what the song needs and also what the audience needs from that song. I think there are two ways of looking at the Flash soundtrack. On the one hand, as the soundtrack to the movie itself, it works brilliantly. You watch the visuals, it's a bit camp, a bit early 80s, taking the piss, but also being paying homage to that era. And on that level, it works superbly. The music actually fits in beautifully. Can you listen to it as an independent album? I don't think so. I think apart from the title track itself, which is very Queen-like with its harmonies and also its awareness of kitsch, it's not a very good album that stands up on its own. I saw the movie Flash, uh, and I rather liked it, actually. Um, I don't know if I liked the movie that much, but I thought the music was really good. But the two worked very well, and I don't think they compromised themselves. Um, as, ro as rock music written for movies go, I think it's one of the better ones. Um, and as, what I mean by them not compromising themselves, it still sounded like Queen. I don't really know too much about Flash. I mean, I've got it. Um, I never listen to it. <laughs> don't need to, because if I put on greatest hits, it's on. the song is on there. Um, there are a couple of heavy bits of incidental music, I think, that, that by Brian May, which excited the guitar fan of Queen. Um, you know, I think it suited its purpose as a film soundtrack. Um, next. Hot Space is the album now that really separates the kind of Queen fans. I can remember when it came out at the time, it was just, people were like, what, what is this? You know, you, the rock, rock fans had sort of allowed them crazy little thing called Love and even Another One Bites the Dust because they were both good songs. Another One Bites the Dust, great song. Some of the tracks on Hot Space do not hold up particularly well now. That's got as much to do with the production and uh, the instrumentation they were using at the time. They sound dated, as does a lot of pop and rock music from 1982, not just Queen. But I think the main thing is the, the songwriting isn't that, isn't that strong. It's a visionary album because Queen have preempted the whole funk metal movement that would happen 10 years down the line or whatever. You know, you listen to bands like Extreme and, and even Faith No More and bands like that that came out and started taking funk and melding it with loud rock guitars. Um, well, that's the, the blueprint for that, it's Hot Space. I mean, it gets very little credit, it gets very little acclaim. I'd be very surprised if, very, if, if, if more than me on this DVD stands up for it and says they like it. I have to admit, I despaired at Hot Space. I think they went headlong into dance and disco and what we would call R&B and electronics these days and really forgot about rooting themselves still in what had gone before. Whatever Queen had done up to that point, with the exception of the Flash out soundtrack, but I think that's a different entity anyway, had always been rooted to some extent in what had gone before. They never took a complete leaf and left behind everything. They seemed to do that with Hot Space. In fact, you did wonder whether Brian May sat in the studio with his head in his hands most of the time saying, what are we doing? It was almost as if something took over with Freddie Mercury saying, I think we really, this, this dance and disco thing is really interesting. I think we should look at how they're doing things and let's see if we can pull it into our own sound. And they ended up pulling their own sound into that area and forgot about their roots. They just jumped in and forgot about holding on to the, the barrier. And that's why I despair at it. Other people hail it as a very brave move and something with some great tracks. I mean, Body Language was a big hit for them, and it does have Under Pressure on there. But for the most part, I think it's an album that you think, what on earth were they trying to do? Surely they must have realised they were losing touch of what had gone before. The works which followed up Hot Space a couple of years later 
really took Queen more back towards what they should have been in the 1970s. There are moments Radio Gaga makes you go, what? But it's almost a novelty hit. I mean, Queen still remain to this day, I do believe, the only band where all four members have single-handedly written a number one hit single. And Radio Gaga was Roger Taylor's contribution. And it sticks in your mind. It was a novelty, fun track with a good video. But the more serious, shall we say, tracks in there, like Hammer to Fall, which is really Brian May's presentation. It's a really great rock song, hard, heavy rock, that could have easily been on Queen too, in its own way. And so I think there were sort of great moments on that record and i want to break free which is another really good pop rock song it's much more classic queen than anything on hot space or possibly even anything on the game the queen fans that hated hot space and looked to the works you know as something that was moving back to what they wanted are reveling in synth pop of Radio Gaga, which hasn't got any guitar in it at all, you know, um, and, you know, the sort of androgynous frippery and frivolity of I want to break free. So hailed as a sort of return to this is what Queen do best, and in fact, I think, a load of pop pap. 1984's The Works album is the beginning of that sort of the reinvention of Queen, because you had Live Aid about a year down the line. And the works had, you know, with Radio Gaga and I Want to Break Free, you had two great pop singles. And I think that started to, they start, Queen started to get their audience back. So the works is kind of, it, there's a rockier sound to it. There's, some, there's one Visions on there, which is this sort of pompous, heavy rock thing, which is great, great way to open the show. Um, but you've got the pop songs and it's still, that you can feel that something's happening, there's a bit of momentum within the band again. Live Aid in 1985 was all about famine relief and a laudable approach absolutely to get that many bands together, that many artists together in two stages in Philadelphia and London to perform and sublimate their egos, at least on the surface, was a tremendous achievement. However, there is one performance that everybody remembers Live Aid for because not only was it the best of the day, it's one of the greatest performances ever captured on film, it was Queen. Absolutely astonishing. And Queen just stole the whole thing. I actually believe that Freddie Mercury sat there and thought, this is my stage, this is my show, this is my 20 minutes, I am going to produce the performance of my life, my band is going to produce the performance of their lives, everybody's going to walk out of here, and everyone's going to be watching on television, and they are going to think at the end of this event, Queen. That's the one word which is going to come to their mind, Queen. And it's not that they resurrected a flagging career, because their career wasn't flagging, but they grabbed the opportunity Maybe partly because there was still the stigma of, of Sun City hanging over them from 1979 when apartheid was still rampant. Queen agreed to go to South Africa and play at a whites only rich resort and they got a huge amount of flack for that. So they did this and it was maybe a bit of redemption in there. But I think mainly it was Freddie Mercury's stage. He was always born to perform on the biggest stage in the world and there was no bigger stage in Live Aid with millions watching around the world and he grabbed that and he made it his own. He was everything he should have been. He was charismatic, he was flamboyant, he was forceful, he was powerful, he sung incredibly well. And while Queen as a band performed very strongly, it was all about Freddie. This was his moment as a star. This is his moment in the spotlight. And throughout his entire career, for whatever he did, this was his shining apogee. Absolutely no doubt about it. This was his greatest moment because he proved to a worldwide audience, not just to pop and rock fans, but a worldwide audience that were into so many different types of music of so many ages and creeds and genders. I am an all time great. And he proved it on that stage for 20 minutes and nobody will ever forget it. Hungary is one of the more open countries of the Eastern Bloc and bestriding the Danube, its capital Budapest, has the beginnings of a mixed economy. Nevertheless, the familiar music is of the classical variety, and the arrival of rock, with its million-dollar paychecks, a relatively new phenomenon. A party to celebrate drummer Roger Taylor's 37th birthday took place in Freddie's presidential suite, at a princely cost of 5,000 pounds. I 
I know you don't think this, but a bird, a bird is going to pop out of that. Try it. But what does Queen get out of a visit to Hungary? There's no profit to be made. I mean, that's not the idea at all. I mean, it's impossible to make a profit. Um, I don't know whether we'll even break even. Maybe we will. Um, but that's not the reason we're doing it anyway. There's a tremendous feeling of sort of, uh, I suppose, job satisfaction is a, a strange way to put it. It's quite good to get job satisfaction after 14 years. Well, it's a pretty good job, isn't it? And interview shy Mercury faced the Hungarian cameras. So you look at it as a, as a beginning of your friendship with, with Hungary and with Budapest, and it, it may last long, as long as Queen will last. If I'm still alive, I will come back. You know. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you. Fine. Fine. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, that's great. I wish all interviews were that short. The interviewer got more out of John Deacon, Queen's bass player and diplomat. It's a great experience and I think it will open the eyes of uh, a lot of uh, uh, people who are working on the show. No. English and Americans, you know, because they, yeah. they have, uh, sometimes they have such a preconceived idea yeah. of what it might be like. The Hungarian government and probably all of the Eastern European governments are interested to give entertainment for the people and young people love rock and roll everywhere. And in terms of money, I mean, the band uh, still uh, pay for the concerts. They can export the income, and it's all uh, paid by the Hungarian government. But there's a limited amount of hard currency to pay bands, so the benefit has to be sought elsewhere. Record sales, for instance. State record shops had a limited supply of the recent Queen album, pressed under license in Yugoslavia. The Hungarians are record mad. Local bands can sell half a million albums. Imports are more expensive. Recently, a number of private record stores have opened specializing in Western music. But Queen are aiming to break into the whole Eastern Bloc market of 300 million potential record buyers. The other incentive is a feature film of the concert, made by a group including the State Film Corporation, which mobilized 17 cameras to shoot 25 miles of film of the concert at a fraction of the cost of a similar venture in the West. This will be released throughout the East this autumn. It's nice to actually go to a place that's... Um, it's like um, um, unconquered territory. So. You have a very extrovert stage act by any standards. Will you be able to go on with... You mean affluente? You're no. over the top. <laughs> no. no. There are certain things that I, that I, I, I use in my stage act, which I know automatically I'll get a certain reaction because I know I've been there before. But over here it's going to be, it's, it's like no man's land, you know, so I mean, but I'm going to try them all. A kind of magic was saved, I think, by Live Aid. There was so much goodwill behind Queen. Um, the sort of, so by the time that came out in 1986, people were willing to uh, give them the benefit of the doubt. It's, it's not an album that, that holds up at all well now. Um, there were hits on it, yes, but what saved it, I think what, what helped it was the tour. They played Wembley, went back, did Wembley Stadium, they did Nebworth that year, 86, uh, off the back of that album. There's a lot of work on, um, on a kind of magic that, that sounds to me like they, they're all mates again and they've, they've, they've learnt what it meant to be in Queen and why they were in Queen and what they should be doing when they were in Queen, um, which I think is kind of borne out by the, the, the wonderfully brilliant series of concerts they did, which was sadly the last that Freddie would ever play live. Um, you know, on the back of on the back of the A Kind of Magic album, um, that that they were back and they were back at their best, you know, before it was all cruelly, you know, the rug was pulled out from underneath them when Freddie became ill. I actually believe The Miracle is more of a band album than may have been the case with A Kind of Magic. They seem to be going through weird phases, as bands do. The first part of their career, there was an album a year, sometimes two, and then when it got to 1980, there were little gaps. And that happens with a lot of bands. Success allows you to take your time, tours get longer, you need more time to recover and write. 
But I think a kind of magic coming so soon after Live Aid almost showcased Freddie Mercury more than anybody else with the miracle it went back to being a band record, but not a great album. By that time, a lot had gone on within the band. Uh, Freddie Mercury had been diagnosed as HIV. Um, Brian Mayer got divorced. So I think there was this real thing of the four band members kind of pulling together again. They'd all gone off and worked on other things, solo projects and so on. There'd been a lot of that going on. And I think they kind of regrouped and, and pulled pulled together. Um, it's a stronger album than the kind of magic. It's possibly not a classic Queen album, but what it does sound like is that the four of them are in the studio and they're together and they've all got a, a common purpose. Innuendo is probably as close as Queen ever got to a Freddie Mercury album without it being called a Freddie Mercury album. It must have been a very tough time because by, by then, it wasn't just rumour. I think everyone knew that he was dying from AIDS, even though he'd not made any official statements. And there were reports about him struggling into the studio, finding it very difficult to do what he had to do. I think for all of them, they knew this was goodbye. This was the last thing they'd ever record with him. He would finish this record if he could, and then that's it. It wasn't going to be very long. And it must have been a case of everyone focusing on allowing Freddie to finish this record because this is what he wanted to do. This was his farewell to everything, not just up to the band, but unfortunately to life itself. I get the feeling that he sort of come to terms with what was happening to him. And because he was a good songwriter and he was a, an artist, you know, and a rock artist, uh, he was able to express it. And I think because of that, so there's some really strong, emotional, heartfelt songs come out of it. And I, I particularly like the record. I think it's a great record. It's easy to look at Innuendo in the light of what had happened. Obviously, Freddie Mercury was very, very ill, and the band knew this, and it was coming, everything in the sense was coming to an end. So it's easy to go back and listen to an album like that and read a lot into the lyrics. I think it does reflect the situation that the group were in at the time. Uh, and there are songs on the album which obviously Freddie Mercury is sort of addressing that. I think what's interesting about it though is that after a decade of sort of fairly commercial mainstream sort of pop rock, which is what Queen had become known for, it almost feels like they've gone right back to the beginning again. And they do it very, did it very well. It leaves you in no doubt that, that everything you think might be going on with the band is going on with the band, but they're just not saying. You know, they're not delivering in black and white. This is the final Queen album, Freddie is going to die, you know. And the fact that you know all that just makes it such a, a very, a, even more emotional listener. I mean, you just hate to think what it would have been like in the studio, trying to put that album together. Um, not on, on, pure, on terms of sort of like, you know, logistics with, with Freddie and how ill he is and whether he can work, but just the, the emotional strain they all must have been under. Um, and they, I mean, they said that Fred just worked and worked consistently. It was like, look, I've got to get as much done, you know, as, as I can. And um, I think it's just a masterful testament to, to Queen with Freddie Mercury. As far as Queen's journey goes as a group, where, where do we go from here as a group? Well, we, Queen and Paul Rogers, <laughs> Paul Rogers, um, which is really Roger, myself and Paul, have been in the studio doing our first studio album. I can't believe I'm saying this really, but it's, it's kind of like a new group. We have a, a load of new songs, completely new material, which is nearly finished, and we'll take them out on tour in September. September, October, November in, uh, in Europe and England and South America. And then maybe we'll take it on, who knows. There's a global audience of around 80 million tonight. How does it feel to play an audience like that? Incredible. I think it's best not to think about it, really. Um, it's best just to treat it as a gig, and there's an audience, there's a live audience out there, and, and the first thing is, is to play to them. Because if they don't enjoy themselves, then the atmosphere won't be right. You know, If they do enjoy themselves, it'll all be a lovely big snowball and lots of good energy, and it'll go out to the world as a happy event. And playing Live Aid and playing this concert, how do, how do they compare? Is there any comparison? Well, it's interesting. I mean, there's... There's a great vibe here today already, you can tell, you know, because Nelson Mandela is such a special figure to everybody, there's so much love here. Um, so in that sense it's comparable to Live Aid, because everyone I remember on that day was there for the right reasons. There was like, you know, we really, really do want to help, you know, for Bob, it was God, Sir Bob was there, it wasn't Sir Bob at the time, but he was bringing all that together. Yes, I think it's a comparable event. Uh, this has the extra ingredient because it's a celebration of a man's life. 
his 90th birthday. What an amazing innings, you know, and what an incredible, incredible life he's had and what an unbelievable impact on the world. There's, there's no equal to Nelson Mandela, is there? No. Roger and I will be doing a little bit as, as well, uh, mainly at the end of the show, but a few special nods to Freddie, you know, particularly on the screens and, and um, yeah, a, little, a few things that you won't expect. Roger, obviously you were friends since student days, yeah. in the band together for decades. Must be an emotional night for you tonight coming up. Uh, yes, I mean, I think, to be honest, I think Freddie would have hated the idea of being 60. Um, <laughs> he would have been appalled, uh, and uh, so would we. But um, uh, it's going to be great. I think the audience are going to be dressing up uh, in, in the sort of to festively for the occasion. So I think it'll be a great atmosphere in the Dominion tonight. What do you think Freddie would have been like at 60? I mean, you say you can't imagine him at 60. Oh, no, I can't. I'm very cantankerous, probably. But um, we miss him still. Yeah, we miss him. We wish he was here. You know, that would be the crowning thing. Yeah. Well, thank you very much. Hope it's a fantastic evening for you. Outrageous frocks at the ready? Uh, yeah, my tutu is being ironed as I speak. <laughs> fantastic. One of Queen's legacies is the fact that, that because each individual member was as strong as the other member, that's why they lasted so long as a band. That's why they were able to change musical styles and bring different things to the table. They were essentially a four-piece heavy rock band. That's what they were, that's what they did. But because of the, the different um, colourful characters within the band, the thing that made Queen special was that they weren't just a heavy rock band, that they could always go outside of that heavy rock norm and create different styles of music and, more importantly, get away with it. People don't try and emulate them because they can't. The Darkness tried that with their second album, with Roy Thomas Baker producing, and it was an incredible flop because they tried to emulate a unique band. Nobody could do what they did. Nobody could do what Freddie Mercury did. They never went with a trend. They were always just their own individual style. And so no matter what the trends around them are, it, it just kind of exists as their own little unit and you can put it in any period through rock and roll and, and it just fits in because it's so unique. They are the epitome of the shameless, shamelessly ambitious rock band. And when you see people like, when you see bands like Oasis or modern bands like Razorlight who've got an outspoken frontman or an outspoken member, talking about what they want and, and, and talking about how they're the best band in the world. If you want to blame it on you can kind of blame Queen. Queen did that first. I think they even more so than groups like Led Zeppelin. Is it Queen, particularly Freddie Mercury, the most vocal about it. They never apologised for it, but they have the body of work to support it. And, and you know, those songs and the albums still hold up. There's two Queens. There's a great rock, there's a great, great rock band and there's a great, great pop band. And the two kind of work perfectly in tandem with each other.